So why don't, don't we kick things off with introductions? Um, I will not be moderating this debate, debate discussion. I'll just be particip participating with my own, um, as usual, unfiltered and, um, you know, brash opinions. Um, <laughs> uh, but but we are we are all uh, we are all equals, so um, yeah. I'm Bruno. I, I founded Remark, which is the NFT 2.0 standard on on Dotsama. Uh, recently pushed into EVM waters and deploying on on various EVM chains. Um, we can go in a circle. So since since you are in in this order on my screen, um, Mr. Tin, would you please um, introduce yourself? Uh, yes, so hello everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Mr. Tin and uh, I co founded the uh, Glimmer Apes DAO um, about a year ago. So I am uh, also a member of the core team of the DAO. And so basically, I'm in charge of uh, building and developing uh, all the projects that the community wants, among which uh, we have the Glimmer Jungle, the Great Escape, uh, our main project, which is an NFT gaming project on Moonbeam. Sweet. All right, Hugo, do you want to go next? There we go, unmuted. Um, yeah, so I'm Hugo. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called MineFT. Um, before that, I uh, founded a project called Cryptograph in the Ethereum ecosystem initially. Um, also created a pretty cool auction system called GBM Auctions. Um, MineFT is launching in beta next week, is the goal. Um, and it's a multi-chain NFT marketplace built out on Substrate Frontier um, uh, using a lot of the, the Moonbeam and Polkadot tech stack. And um, our goal long term is to be a place where you can trade any NFT in any currency um, on any network, which is the, the long term goal for us. So, yeah, it's good about me. Cool. All right. I am getting some beeping um, periodically. So could could anybody who's not speaking at the moment just mute so we can s isolate that out it's like a timer sounds like a timer of some some kind um david jones you're up next uh, hi everybody david jones here project lead of the damn Paris society we're a game fi slash nft project with collections on moon river and arbitrum nova so wait short and sweet nice um josh you're up next hey everyone i'm josh here external relations at zudao so my role at zudao is to connect with lots and lots of nft projects and teams from ethereum and moonbeam and um, so zudao is focused on providing all nfts with a sustainable universal solution to nft utility and the broader goal of zudao is to bring the masses into DeFi by gamifying yield farming so we launch um, really, 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 really soon. Uh, so we're looking forward to the Moonbeam community's uh, participation and feedback in our, our in our V zero launch. Awesome! And uh, last but not least, cherry on top, Miami. Go. Um, hi, friends. Miami, co-founder, programmer, Moonbeams. Uh, we're a long time, like almost a year ago, we started coding on uh, Moon River. It's just an NFT marketplace that we are focuses on uh, EVM chains. So kind of what um, Hugo from NFT was saying, I think at the end of the day for inter interoperable NFTs, the user has to be able to trade NFTs from chain to chain without realizing that they're using other chains, basically. And that's our goal as well for the project. And I think you guys have heard me talk a lot in the past, so I don't think we need to get into more details. All right, we can get into those um, as we discuss these these things. So um, as we are kicking this off, we are all in the middle of a major nuclear meltdown of the crypto markets, which is um, refreshing to some, frustrating to others. And um, I, I am personally looking forward to a, the great reset in, in crypto, which gets us back to our decentralized roots. And... Um, and uh, actively pushes back against the coming regulation that will be the result of this disaster. Um, however, we do know that this will probably affect NFTs as well in a, in a large uh, degree, especially as you know, um, you have these high value NFTs that are now completely melted away. And as these, these you know, projects, treasuries and founders who actually have high value NFTs are trying to liquidate them to cover the losses that they're now experiencing, 
Um, what do you see as um, like the current state of the NFT space in 2022 versus what it's going to look like in 2023? Um, and like, do you think it's dead to the point of needing a narrative shift or can we salvage this? Can we recover this um, in a way that, you know, doesn't really set us all back generation. Yeah, um, I'll sort of have a jump in here a little bit. Um, I think we're probably going to see sort of a split from what what's happened to what what's going to happen. And obviously, we're positioned in the game game five player tool and type of space, so we we obviously think that that is a direction more things will go down. I think the the the, the main art, artworks, the people who are on there who are buying. The NFTs for the art, not just for speculation. Those, those will, those will be fine. The prices might be lower, they might be higher. Who knows? But I think that the actual art that people are buying, that they're they're, they're going to be absolutely fine. The key collections, the core profile picture collections, they're probably going to survive um, because they've gained such critical mass at this point, and um, or they've got provenance, crypto punks, etc. So those two sides of the market will be fine. Um, I think anyway, and then we get a lot of the projects in between where if you've not got a unique value proposition, um, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle to maintain users and interest in your project. Um, so I think that's something that we've all got to be cautious of, which is, you know, do we have something that people will want to enjoy long term that has more longevity than just trading for trading's sake? So in the future, we see. NFTs and projects that have not not just utility, the words thrown around too much, but something that people enjoy, whether that is art or whether that is something that they're doing. And that's where we think we'll, we'll be when we come out of this uh, this storm, should we say. Yeah. Miami, you were going to say something? Yeah, I personally welcome the storm. I'm on the side with you, Bruno, as well. Like, I don't welcome, of course, everybody that got hurt in the FTX fiasco. And everything going down but i think it's another another nail yet another nail in the why this decentralization matters and it impacts everything including nfts but i think it impacts us in like a society um like monetary wise not functionality wise so like going forward projects are still building things unique to them and things that they want to do whether it's a game whether it's art whether it's like music nfts at the end of the day, yeah, funding is lower now because markets are less, like people are more restrained in their spending. But at the end of the day, you still be able to build out your vision to some degree. And I think in the long term, this is obviously beneficial for crypto. And in the short term, it's not that impactful towards NFTs in the vision that we're trying to build out here. Yeah. I'd just add to that um, that I think the the more speculative forms of NFTs, let's say, are going to die a fairly fast death, I think, over the coming uh, months. And I think that um, it's going to drive more innovation in the market, which I think is great. Um, and oh, apparently my mic is beeping. Um, I have no idea how to solve that. Um, Anyway, I, I'll, I'll let someone else talk until I figure out this this this, this beeping issue is very strange. Um, but um, all right, I'll, um, I'll let you go for it. I'll figure this out. All right, cheers. Um, yeah, so obviously, I mean, what I'm worried about in, in all of this chaos is not particularly this this whole uh, treasury meltdown. I think projects that held their funds in centralized exchanges deserve to burn. And um, I think retail that held their funds in, in central exchanges deserve to burn. Um, I think these are all very important, expect, expensive lessons. I started my crypto journey by just losing one Bitcoin on BitMEX. Um, and that, that stuck with me forever. It's, uh, it's, it's been an incredibly valuable lesson that I would gladly pay again. Um, what I am worried about, though, in this case, is that um, this scared off a lot of retail. And since we're all like a bunch of us here, like 50% of this, this panel is building uh, a cross chain NFT marketplace. Um, so to the point that we are competition, we're also in collaboration in many other ways, but 
how 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 much of an impact can we expect there when we're building um, consumer facing marketplaces and expect to you know feed our teams on commissions when they have now been scared off due to uh, well just pure stupidity and uh, and you know lack of clear education on what to do with your crypto funds and what not to do. So do you think this will have a major effect in in twenty twenty three? Uh, if I uh, can jump in, I would say that, uh, yes, this is going to be uh, uh, a little of, of a problem, but we've seen that before in the past where we had the narratives basically after the crash in 2017, where you could see in the newspaper that Bitcoin was dead, that cryptocurrency was out, and yet it came back to birth. So I think that we should not uh, over worry about the retailers because it, ultimately they will come back. It might take two years or three years for the confidence to build back again but uh i think if 2023 might be a bit difficult but on the on longer perspective uh this shouldn't be an ultimate concerns either i think uh, it's it's going to go back because uh as more products are, are created and people gain trust back maybe in the markets because of global uh, economics as well uh, are not looking bright right now uh they might be um more inclined to go again towards uh, investing in blockchain. At the end of the day, as one of the marketplaces, like this reference by Bruno here, um, yeah, this hurts the current market and we've all seen it in our analytics for our trading volumes going down and everything. But at the end of the day, I'm a firm believer if you build a product, right? And if you build a product that it's not chose for Web3 users, but a way for Web3 users to transition to Web3, then you're not just bringing in like speculative retail, which is what a lot of crypto brings in right now. Um, it's a lot of just people here for the money, here to make more money, and then they just lose it and they walk away from it. Uh, if you build a product that they're used to, then people who are not here for that at least feel more comfortable using this platform. And then ideally that would lead to more uh, content generation because at the end of the day, crypto and pretty much anything that's like... Um, kind of like uh, art driven or NFTs or games. It's everything about the content. That's why big platforms like Twitch, they do well because other content creators, not because of who made the platform. And I think once crypto gets to a point where we can have platforms that are to this standard, then it should be fine. Like we should be bringing in new people and not just from speculative market that are just trying to flip a canary for money. They're just actively trying to be involved in the community. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. Is that the retail that's been scared off or that you know that have lost funds, and they are going to be they're going to take some time to come back, right? They're not you don't just lose all your money and then be like, oh, I'm just going to do that again. That was a great idea. I really enjoyed that. And so there has to be some there has to be some time. It's not just going to click fingers and everyone's like, oh yeah, let's get back into it. So that there's going to be fallout for that. So how do you get retail users back? Well, yeah, you, you, you don't get them back as such. They they come back, and you have to be ready for them when when they want to return. So sort of as Miami said, building something that they're familiar with, something that gives them confidence, that's a, a great step. It's a huge step, um, and all the users that you do get that that do you know buy an NFT in this market that are traded on your platform still, those are users that you you'll need to keep and you want to keep. So it's, it's sort of getting those users and keeping the experience good for them, but also waiting for the next the next round of people to sort of come. I don't think, especially right now, there's anything you can particularly do to persuade people to jump in because it is just, it's too soon, too wrong. Yeah, and I think um, compared to like the 2018, 2019 crypto winter, this one kind of feels a little bit different. I don't know if you guys feel that as well, but uh, I remember just radio silence across all platforms, across all teams, everyone was just hiding their heads in the sand. Um, but it seems like this time, uh, a lot of NFT builders and uh, projects are just still building away furiously, you know, um, and still active, still pushing forward. So I think this is kind of a, a, a change since last time, so I'm not um, maybe not as pessimistic uh, about the the longer term, like uh, six months to a year. Yeah, I think it's one of the things where a lot of us here have seen it before, and a lot of people have been through a cycle have seen it before. I mean, this time it's completely ridiculous. It's beyond the scale of 
stupid AI anyone could have imagined, probably. But it's it's just another it's it's another crash. It is just it's happened before. It'll happen again. But we're still going to keep going forward. All right, interesting. Um, okay, that's that's um, kind of weirdly optimistic. I'll take it. Um, now let's switch gears a little bit into um, NFT bridging, which is what what we're here to basically basically talk about. And one thing in spe specifically is what what kind of worries me. Um, this is why we started Remark on in the Polkadot ecosystem just to leverage this cross chain communication promise that. Um, you know, would let us communicate across these chains and, and transfer the NFTs securely and safely. And again, this crisis was highly educational in unbacked bridgeable assets as the, um, you know, the Solana mock chain went down and uh, melted the SOBTC assets that it had on it that were completely unbacked because they were minted by a now defunct exchange. Um, this is also a type of bridging, if you will, um, that is completely centralized. And in, in fact, most bridges today that exist are either requiring separate incentive mechanics where you have nodes in between chains communicating those messages. And so now you have the need for a token to incentivize those nodes to, to do some work, or they're just centralized servers pretending to be bridges, as, as we know from you know several projects in not just the entire ecosystem, but even in the Datsama ecosystem. So how safe will um hugo how safe will my nft be against these disasters on a chain level when a chain melts down because of excessive centralization like for example bsc falls apart or um you know um any other you know centralized chain that you that you bridge to how would those bridged assets behave am i still beeping Mike, Mike working? Yeah, you're still you're still beeping, but only when you're speaking, which is interesting, I think. Um, How yeah. weird. Yeah. Um, but it's it's fine, it's fine. We'll tolerate okay. it. Okay. 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 It's so weird. I cannot 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 possibly explain it. Um I think that uh, I mean, tell me if it gets too much and I'll just mute myself again and I'll just be a a, 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 a viewer for this for this session. But um the the um, the cross chain bridging aspect of things is is super interesting. It's a big reason why we jumped into this uh, 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 ecosystem as well. Um, for us, as a as a network, we built a, a sort of version one of a bridge that would allow sort of standard migration between at least the Ethereum ecosystem and Moonbeam, and we want to broaden that to this deeper migration sort of proposition that we're that we're building which is being able to migrate full functionality with the provenance of the nft um being tracked cross network um uh, uh, and we, we're putting together a standard for that and our bridge uh in its version two will hopefully be able to to, to show proof of concept of those of those movements but from the stack ourselves in terms of how we would deal with 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 problems like that i mean for us to communicate to all of the other networks that we operate with, we run through our own L1, if you will, my chain, which is a substrate frontier network, which is where all the customer interactions occur. And then the settlement layers are the settlement layers because that's where the security matters the most. Um, so in terms of direct bridging problems for our marketplace, there aren't really any other than the bridge that we're producing um, in in uh, in the form of if people want to move fully their asset from say Ethereum to Moonbeam to start with, um, that we would need to make sure that it's you know up to scratch and not got any of the potential security risks. One of the things we've done is separate this idea of the bridge and the relay. So bridge is where the storage occurs, and the relay is obviously who can write in the bridge, and anybody can spin up a relay to write what they need to do into the bridge, and that could be a centralized relay, a decentralized relay. A, the, the customer can pick which relay has the most to lose, um, you know, and and sort of a chain of trust in that in that fashion. Um, but bridges are like definitely a part of the next iteration of this technology. And the first versions that the world has put out there have definitely had their problems. Um, I think it's a natural, it's going to be a natural evolution. Um, you know, the big 
the big holy grail in our book will be something that is a you know a trustless two-way bridge i think a trustless one-way bridge is viable and there are ways of doing that we're looking at some interesting ways although a little further down the line the two-way one is going to be difficult but I don't doubt the ability of the innovators in this space to be able to to to, to produce that. I've got a sort of a question from um, a personal point of view, I guess, well, from a project point of view. We've looked at NFT bridges before because we would like our users to be able to use their assets and their assets be recognised where they want to use them. You know, they own the asset where they where they have it is up to them. Now. For certain things to work, we need to basically mirror the collection on a different chain. So if you have ID 7098, that represents your asset, it goes up to the RIPFS documentation. So if someone does bridge with the MyNFT bridge technology, does it get represented as the same token with the same ID, et cetera? Does the IPFS data get transferred as well? I, IPFS data, I'm not too sure about my CTO would need to answer that, but the idea is that the token is represented in its same form, especially when we enable this full migration idea. I mean, if you, if you're just wrapping something and migrating something without functionality, which is what we do today, you know, you're essentially just trading a deed somewhere else. And it's predominantly a liquidity, um, uh, uh, uh maneuver, but, um, with full functionality, the idea is to represent exactly what was on ethereum let's say or whatever other network on uh the network that you're porting to but it would be with the uh kind of um with, with the blessing or the permission of the original creator and the publisher particularly if there's ip rights involved and that would be essentially a permissioned transmission between two smart contract universes where you know one uh, uh the publisher says this is this is our world in, in moonbeam and that's our world in ethereum and so we should be able to represent uh, uh, both is the goal. I am not the CTO. I have a very, I have an abstract uh, knowledge of the technology. My my CTO Guillaume is the real genius here, so I can't give you real detail. But definitely, the plan is to represent um, the token as closely as possible on, on each network. Cool. And I'm just going to open the door to this, but um, as an in between stage, why is this not feasible to be achieved through like just uh, like interchain communication, like not necessarily changing to sending the NFT to a new chain, but just taking the chain that holds the NFT and just verifying and just checking functionality through it in some way that's like um, not, so we don't have to handle, like we can't, in theory, we shouldn't be have to create a new collection in every singular chain just to be able to like seam seamlessly pass it through because that just creates a lot of overhead and a lot of chaos to not just the collection creator, um, but people also using the collection itself. Um, so I'm just thinking that maybe there is a way that we can have, I know it's still more, a little bit more, this, uh, more centralized, but a way that we can just have communication between chains to be able to set a lack of better word, a standard that we can start using to transition into full decentralized bridges that are able to handle this functionality that you're saying. Mm, yeah, that would be the ideal, but you can't really, talk to another chain if you don't know which node you're talking to. And if you don't know which node you're talking to, you need an RPC endpoint. And if you're depending on an RPC endpoint, you're depending on, an, on a URL that can disappear. So it's an Oracle problem more than anything. Um, yeah, we, we yeah. sort of looked at that and ha having to have a centralized Oracle in the middle doesn't, doesn't help anything really. In fact, it probably makes it more vulnerable having to run a specific technology design for yourself. Yeah, yeah that's there where it becomes yeah. centralized. That, yeah, that's the part that I was mentioning that was centralized where it's like, that is the failure point, but it's just like, I mean, at some point, some innovators are going to come in and be like, maybe we get X NFTs and they just work really well across Polkadot and then Polkadot becomes like the standard for that kind of thing. But we don't know how that's going to work kind of in the near future. Yeah, I think introducing any centralized part into this is just repeating the mistakes of the past. Um, and you're just depending on that Oracle being there. And as we've seen, even with some you know treasury funded teams that have produced pretty cool apps um when that money dries up when the interest dries up the app is gone it can't be updated anymore and you lose potentially good tools good teams good projects um you know 
so many things from the beginning of the Polkadot's you know, inception, Polkadot ecosystem's inception, no longer work because there's nobody to update the metadata, nobody to update the apps, nobody to re-upload the front ends and do whatever needs to be done to keep them up to date, which I think is, is pretty sad because there's so many dependencies on these third-party aspects that, that, you know, can just disappear. On the other hand, if you look at ecosystems like, um, like Ethereum, um, you know, there's not a single smart contract that doesn't work the same way it did when it was launched. Um, you know, even if it's eight years old, you can still call it directly. You can still invoke it directly and it'll work. And you can very easily wrap a UI around it and it works. And so I think we should strive for that. And as we're on, on Moonbeam and as we're talking about, you know, this EVM compatibility, we should strive towards just forcing people to be as decentralized as possible and have progressive centralization, not progressive decentralization. So you should start maximally decentralized and maximally slow and impractical, but such that it works. And then add a caching layer, add a database, add an indexer if you need to, um, you know, host your front end on AWS, but you start with the decentralized parts first. And then once your centralized stuff dies and make no mistake, it will die, uh, projects, shift priorities, teams leave, um, they get bought out, they exit, they just lose the treasury to FTX meltdowns, you know, stuff happens. So if you have that layer of decentralized downtime resistant stuff underneath everything, then you have a truly bulletproof system. And this is why centralized oracles for transporting NFTs back and forth are just a no, uh, for me, just a non-acceptable compromise. You know, if you have something that's pretending to be a bridge, but it's actually just a database on a server that reads the status of a contract and then pretends that you've equipped some item onto something. That is not an NFT bridge and that is not an NFT standard. That is a Web2 app that's using a very inefficient database to show people something they want to see. Um, you really have to have some sort of decentralized backbone to your projects. Otherwise, you're not really contributing anything to Web3. So this is why I like what my NFT is doing with the matching of the relays and the matching of the collections from one chain to the other chain such that we know always what what which part maps to and such that we know always where an nft came from one of the interesting aspects of that project is that as you transfer an nft from chain a to chain, chain b the metadata on the destination will get uh, extra information added to it that says where the nft came from which i think is missing on a lot of these bridging mechanics, which basically just mint counterfeit NFTs. They just mint, you know, copies of NFTs, unauthorized copies on other, on other chains. But this one, this one has provenance attached to it, which I think is really cool and a step in the right direction. Yeah, I think I can, I 100% agree with that. Like, if, there is, if we take something as iconic as like a Fidenza and that is moved to a different chain, why you'd move it, I don't know. Let's just say you do, you need to know that that is the only one that is still the original the whole point around art and supply is that you can you've got proof of ownership of that asset if we if we lose that along the way whether it's a hundred dollar asset or a hundred thousand dollar asset it, it just breaks what what we're looking to do completely agreed all right so um Glimmer Apes, you guys are focused on growing in the Moonbeam ecosystem. Do you have cross-chain aspirations? And if so, what kind? What do you want to accomplish by going elsewhere? Uh, yes, it's definitely something we are considering at the moment. Um, so the good question is going uh, cross-chain, but for what? I think this is the elephant in the room. Uh, right now, there are not that many uh, features that are developed, but we can see some projects starting to develop on other chain that could be interesting. So one way, one thing that we are looking at basically is uh, what would be the added benefits of uh, going cross-chain. Um, the most obvious one is uh, obviously to uh, cooperate with other projects. So one thing that we would like to do is uh, find ways to create partnerships with other collections across different chain to do one common, uh, I would say one common, for example, map in a game where all these projects could, could play together. 
uh, that's definitely something that um, we would like to do. Uh, one other thing as well is that I think that in the next months or years, uh, we're going to see uh, some maybe new features that don't exist yet on other uh, chains. And that will be a strong movers for many NFT collections who go cross chain. So basically just by starting now to see what's out and trying it, because we are at the very early days, I think it will give us uh, an edge uh, when maybe more advanced technology is going to come out. Uh, that's that's really what we are uh, trying to do here. Cool. Okay, same question, David Jones. Yeah, I think um, for us, there's, there's a couple of things is that what we've, we've sort of found is that a lot, especially at this point of the market now, um, sort of a year into the bear market, I suppose, is that people seem to become chain centric. They, they pick their chain that they like, and that's where they stay. There isn't, there isn't a lot of reason for people to be looking outside of what they know because there isn't these massive pumps and stuff going on in different chains. Oh, it's all going off here. Let's all let's all go see what's over here. That that stage of the market seems to have just gone for them. So rather than users trying to sort of beg users to come come here, come here, this is where we are, come see what we're doing. We've sort of gone down the line, we're gonna to have to go to where you are so we can show you what we've got and then you can you can stay in your ecosystem, you can stay on your chain but still be part of the project. Um, and I think it sort of lends itself down the lines. If you go right to the end of the line, it's people don't even necessarily know which chain they're on, what chain they're playing on. They, they just know that they're playing a game. And if we can sort of, you know, take the Web3 aspect out of it in visuals to users, that's going to be a huge benefit. So if you're, well, yeah, exactly. Right, I mean, so like, if, 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 you can, if you can do that and you can achieve that, then you can have your game or your projects over 10 chains, 20 chains, and just have everyone playing together in the same room. And that's that's going to be huge. So that's that's the kind of interoperability, you know, the, the common goal of like, especially put the poker ecosystem is everyone sort of together and you can be wherever you want, you can act wherever you want. So that's that's the main reason why we're looking looking at it. But obviously it's not it's not always so easy to to make it work because you you're doubling your overheads potentially. You're, having two players on two different chains. So there's absolutely risks to it. But we strongly believe that having a project across multiple chains is the best way for survivability, I guess, as well as onboarding. Mm, agreed. Well, on the topic of expanding and being multi-chain, um, Josh, you're gamifying yields. Is there a particular reason why you're doing this on glimmer um, instead of any other popular EVM and do you intend to gamify yields on glimmer alone or leverage some of the XCM stuff to gamify yields from you know connected chains to the polkadot ecosystem yeah so definitely that's kind of our primary reason for uh, moonbeam being our first deployment is because of this promise of interoperability so let's say like a user uh, with voting with AUSD on Akala could battle someone voting with uh, a Glimmer LP in the Moonbeam battle. Um, NFT battles is our core product, for those of you who don't know. Um, so yeah, this is something we're super excited about. And this is the, the promise that we're working towards. But I think we need to let XCM and cross-chain messaging mature a little bit first um, before we kind of yeah commit commit to that. Yeah, it is a bit early, but but it does does show promise. This is also why we built Skybridge um, in the ecosystem. We are now kind of shifting between Moon River and Moonbeam, but in general, this is exactly why to leverage XCM to port as many collections over into into the metaverse and to allow everybody from any chain to build their own presence in the metaverse and for a change. Finally, in a fully decentralized way, we'll see how that plays out. Um, That's what we're all here in Polkadot. Yeah, like that's yeah. literally the selling point of Polkadot. Yeah, exactly. One of the things that I've noticed about Polkadot's, uh, well, Glimmer's um, apps is that more and more are using, are ditching the anti-pattern of requesting that users switch network or even connect their wallet for even the basic operation. This is one of the first things that I really liked about Moonbeans, where, um, you know, typically when you use any app in the Ethereum ecosystem, you will not be able to use two different ones in the same browser because they will 
keep fighting each other, like switch this network, switch this wallet, switch this, switch that. And um, some of them will not even show you the landing page if you don't connect the wallet. And uh, I've long been arguing against it, especially because it's so easy to resolve as a, you know, from a developer perspective. So this is something I love seeing, especially in a multi-chain environment, you really can't have one chain completely taking control of your browser plugin wallet and just disabling all the other apps that you're trying to interact with um, at the same time it's it's such a disaster and it completely prevents this collaboration of projects that we're talking about um, what other anti-patterns patterns have you have you noticed and you're you're working towards what what do you think you can do that is you know that that beats the other ecosystems in terms of ux um i'll just quickly jump in on that because that's a really interesting point and for us i mean the first five chains that you'll be able to use on mine you when the beta eventually goes live is is you know ethereum polygon binance smart chain moonbeam and moon river and to be able to run that you know we have to run a node on every network they all have to go through the l1 the ux sort of solution is that you know we have a sort of prepaid balance structure and everything goes through that and you can interact with all the chains via that. And so for a user, you know, you sign up in a web two dominant design aspect, you know, password email, because that's how the majority of people understand the internet. But we create you a non-custodial wallet on the other side. And as you, you know, you can understand a non-custodial, you can understand a, an account and a prepaid balance. If you're a power user, there's more degrees of things you can do. You can connect other wallets, you can import your MetaMask, et cetera, et cetera. But if you are just an average Joe, and this is the first time you've experienced it with it, experience with sort of Web3 and NFTs, we're hoping that this is a slightly easier easier route for people. And from that standpoint, they're going to be able to um, you know, interact with all these different networks and learn through that. You know, they'll start to figure out that oh, actually this, this is, you know, rather than using the fiat on-ramp or structure that we've got there for you, actually, I'm just going to do it straight in crypto because it's just easier, right? You know, like you have to bring, open the gate wider to start with and then they'll, you know, people will slowly educate themselves as they go through um just on the anti-pattern part um you know multi-chain you can do things like multi-currency market orders right like we want people to be able to sell an nft on ethereum index it in dollars but accept uh you know glimmer dot um river and bnb all within the same order um via a gbm auction for example um and this is you know when we can put that possibilities in the hands of power users and, and, and new users, people will begin to, well, we're hoping for the new users, it will feel like, oh, well, this is how it should work. You know, like I just, you know, I select, I select the, the network, I select the thing and I should be able to combine things. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm walking around with a wallet with 20 different tokens in it, why can't I use them uh, uh, everywhere? That's definitely part of our thinking in trying to sort of break, um, the siloed approach to MetaMask, Ethereum, you know, RPCs and nothing else. <laughs> yeah, that's our end goal too. And like, I was going to say, it, it's not really an empty pattern because Bruno already touched about it, but like what Talisman is doing, like the wallet is just a lot easier to use, but you don't care about network you're in. Basically just pull all your tokens already. You don't need to import tokens. Like unless you're like doing some sketchy tokens that you really should like try to do, but Things like this go a long way for the user. Like a user should be able to just show up at an NFT marketplace, for example, and be able to buy with whatever currency they have and receive the NFT in the new chain that they're buying it if it's a different chain. It, like the chain should be relevant to what their interaction is, like their user journey should be. Uh, it should be like a like a second thought behind the scenes, kind of the same way that a backend, like the regular user doesn't know what a backend is, doesn't know how to interact with the backend, but the front end makes it really simple for them to be like, oh, just put in my email, here's my email, hit enter. Now you have an account. They don't know how the account got created, but for crypto to make an account, you have to go through so many stages and have a base knowledge, which is inherently causing a rift between, I'm going to go back to the content creators in the current Web2 platform and why they don't jump into Web3. It's because it, it involves an extra learning curve that to them doesn't make sense because from Web2 ruined them. Like they're used to just being like, oh, just sign in with Google, done. And it's done. Um, so we need to have kind of similar systems, ideally more decentralized in Web3, where we could just onboard people into creating accounts and being able to trade without having to put in all their details and without having to know the basics of um, uh, having their own wallet and managing their own wallet, even though they should still do it, but we can guide them into that after they already joined. 
we can guide them into that process because the goal is to educate them, not to just like force convert them. Uh, yeah, I, I agree hundred percent with what you just said, and I think as well it's quite nice to see all the progress that has been made over the past year when it comes to this because we've probably all used uh, Polka GS wallets, and it's really uh, I'm really glad to see that now we have like Talisman or uh, Sub Wallet because it's really day and night. Uh, so if we can push it to the next level where anyone that doesn't have very, very limited knowledge of what uh, blockchain or crypto is can just use this as easily as they can use, say, PayPal. Uh, that could as well really help uh, onboard tons of new people onto using the blockchain without really realizing it. And I think that's one of the main um, promoter of growth that uh, interoperability could bring, actually. That's... Um... That's a good point. And to, to Miami's point, there was a platform a few years ago called Pepo where they used, they, they made some sort of TikTok before TikTok. Uh, I think it was a ripoff of Periscope, but made Web3 in a way. Um, I think uh, the ETH Bounties team was, was heavily involved with it as well. Um, anyway, it was, um, it was a mobile app. You would sign up in it. You would not be told that you are making anything crypto-wise. Well, it would kind of be hinted, but you wouldn't be required to do anything complicated. And once you were done, it would do this fun concept that we are now exploring at Remark for Skybridge and other stuff that we'll release as a, as a plugin for others to use um, called Session Keys. And these, well, at least in that app, they worked um, by using the main account to generate a derivative account, which would be you know, funded with some dust, but always unlocked in the app. And so the user would never be exposed to this address and the user would never have to type in the password, but they would always be interacting with tokens. So when you would send a like to somebody, you would actually send a token, uh, but this would be signed behind the scenes. It would not bother you with crypto UX ever. So the users were, were uh, immune to it. But everything that they got was sent to their main address. And they could cash this out in the form of, of gift cards from this app. It never took off. It shut down shortly after because there was just no interest. But it was a fun experiment that led us to play with burner wallet implementations in, in form of this, this session key setup, where essentially in order to get especially for a mobile wallet experience, to get a good experience, you must let a user um, just not experience it at all. Just as long as the user has no exposure to Web3, they will use Web3 easily. So what you get is you, you take this kind of main key, you generate a new address from it, um, or just a new address in general, you seed it with a little bit of dust from the main key, and then you use that as a burner wallet. So the private key is basically in the URL that the user clicks. Um, even if this URL is hijacked and somebody steals that private key somehow, uh, that sub key, that sub wallet is actually bound to certain actions that you can do. So you can have, in a metaverse, you can have a key for movement only. And so even if somebody hijacks your key, the worst they can do is move you around a little bit. So this is something that we're experimenting with where you have a whitelisted list of actions that you can do in your project and you can generate sub keys for um, but mainly for easy transport into mobile environments so that you can still dodge you know the ridiculous 30 percent tax from apple that they are trying to you know levi on the nft sales or whatever other restrictions will will happen now after this after this chaos so yeah looking forward to more ux um innovations i've got um, sort of a quick question for you i suppose bruno so obviously we're talking about interoperability between chains um, something that we've discussed internally and, and with some other teams on different different they are on different chains but not necessarily key to that is about nft assets interacting between different games now we know that sort of the play to own the play to own sort of slogan uh play to own sorry sort of says that this is the asset this is the time i've put into the asset therefore it should have some value to it you know, you can think of a World of Warcraft account at max level. Now, some people might not want to sell that account. They have put a lot of time into it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have value. So taking that account and potentially using that character in a different game is something that appeals to us because you might have 
made quite a strong relationship with that character. And with, you know, statistics and levels and experience all being put on chain, potentially, for all these characters, it'd be quite easy for another game to, hey, you're max level, this is the kind of player we want. If you come to our game, you're going to get a 50% experience boost for the, the first three weeks or whatever. And we see that as being, one, a way to attract users, potentially, if, if it becomes a thing. And two, it gives the, the assets more value than the ecosystem they're in if if the game went bust like you know with the stock guild wars 2 being developed anymore you're like well what, what else are we going to play so like do you see that as being something that web 3 applications and games can leverage and should leverage potentially oh yeah for sure this is exactly what we've built with the soulbound 2.0 system where you have exactly that the reputational avatar system that is applicable not just to any protocol like zudao where you can actually have an avatar that grows its reputation based on performance in the yields, but also for games, if you have an avatar that's a transferable NFT, but that avatar can contain another NFT that's a backpack full of items that are also NFTs, that's that's a game engine built in there. But also that same avatar can have an NFT brain that's non-transferable, basically Soulbound 2.0 into the avatar. And that brain can equip skills and attributes and level up over time and actually keep what they've accomplished in in that game, but along with any other po-ups, accomplishments, achievements, uh, awards, buffs, debuffs, and everything else that you can you can accomplish in a game, you can very easily take that out. But you can never sell or change or move those attributes that you've accomplished in these in these you know Soulbound 2.0 setups. So this is exactly what we've built, and this is exactly what we want to build with with the launch of, of Skybreach just as a demo that this stuff is possible and that you can actually do it in a fully decentralized way. You don't need to store this information in a database. And because it's based on a clean standard that basically fits all use cases that we've talked to so far, I think we have a good chance at making this the next catalyst for the new age of you know, the NFT booms. Um, beyond 2023's chaos. Because um, we will need a little bit of time to recover from this, but we'll also need a little bit of time to build this out and to really build these connections between the games and the avatars and to you know, get some value into those. Um, you know, I call it ownership of experience. So get some value into those NFTs that you have to, to prove that they are valuable, that they are possible, and that they are interoperable between not only you know, projects, but also chains and projects between different chains through advanced bridging structures, like the ones we talked about today. So I think we have, we all have like a huge catalyst on our hands that we just need to leverage in order to trigger the next NFT bull market. Yeah, I'd be 100% there um, on a personal level. Like I'm really looking forward to the next World of Warcraft or RuneScape being built in Web3 with the in-game economies like tied to real world value. I think this, as you as you say, will be the next catalyst for the, the big boom. Um, yeah, I'm sure that there are some like swords that will sell for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> I'm calling it now. No well, doubt. I mean, we can all see that, you know, skins and cosmetics in games should be NFTs, right? I'm, I'm assuming everyone here has pretty much agreed on that because Rather than, you know, here's hundred here's a hundred pounds, here's a skin that we actually still own, but thanks for thanks for giving us the money. If we ban you, then you lose it. Your fault. So that marketplace, I think I saw I saw something the other day about Valorant and you know, users spending sort of thirty million dollars a month on on assets they don't even own. And it, that that is coming. People are gonna realise seeing that that's a really bad deal for the actual user. Um so I think that just being here and being ready to say, look, this technology is already ready. We're ready to exploit it. That it's just it's coming. So we just got to ready for it, really. Yeah, I mean, Hearthstone is a perfect example. Um, people spend serious, serious sums of money on their Hearthstone collections, and a player, a famous player, does something that's politically not not favourable, and boom, gone. Um, definitely a problem. I think I just want to throw in there as well. The other thing that super excites me about sort of 2023 and beyond is how we're going to apply NFTs to new markets. So how you're going to start bringing new kinds of un, unregulated property to start with 
non-fungible assets that exist in you know, our physical reality and how we bring them bring them on chain. Um, what the deposit and redemption procedures are going to be, how you tokenize and untokenize those things. And I think that's going to create uh, 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 a massive new wave of interest and cycle in the market if if people could start doing that with interesting interesting new assets. Definitely something we want to focus on at my NFT. Awesome.